Good morning, everyone. Just give it, it looks like a couple more people are entering right now. So give it a few minutes. I hope everyone's doing well today. Happy with the easing of restrictions starting tonight. Perfect. So we'll go ahead and get started. For all of you that don't know, my name is Emma. I'm the events manager that you've probably seen thousands of my emails come through or spoken to me on the phone. Unfortunately, we haven't met in person, but maybe next year. What I'm going to do quickly is just go around and introduce our team for the ones that were able to attend today, which I think I only see a couple of them here. We have Gary and Anton, our volunteer managers. And then we do have Sabina Wills, who is our CEO, who I don't see in here yet, and Sam Lawson, who is our project coordinator, which they'll be joining here in a little bit. And then we'll have some of our board members as well hopping in when they can. Oh, I see Sabina there. We'll just have her give a quick little wave now that she's in here. Perfect. So quickly kind of over the boring stuff about today, just a little bit of a guideline of what's gonna happen is everyone will remain muted. When it is your turn to speak, you'll just click on the unmute button in the bottom left corner of your screen. After that, you'll just take one to two minutes to talk about your project. So I will be calling on just project names instead of group names because some groups have entered multiple projects just to make it a little bit easier on everyone. And then You'll take the one to two minutes. If for any reason you're coming up on those two minutes, getting closer, I'll give a thumbs up in my corner. So just keep an eye out for that. If we go too far over, I will unfortunately have to kind of cut in just to make sure that we stay on time for today. Um, another thing is that we do encourage everyone to participate in the chat feature. So we will be kind of chatting with there. It's a good way to network. You can connect privately with someone if you want to speak with them after today about what they're doing because we do have multiple cities participating in the program today. Perfect. So what I'm going to do now is pass off to Gary to speak a little bit about Keep Victoria Beautiful and our founder, Dame Phyllis Frost. Thanks, Emma. Um, Cape Victoria Beautiful. Some of you probably have little or no idea of how Cape Victoria started or why it started or when it started. So I'll give you a, a, a quick uh, rundown of that. There, uh, to me, there's a, a funny tale to it in the end, but uh, yeah, Cape Victoria Beautiful started around about 52 years ago. Um, started off originally as an anti-litter campaign We've now broadened out to be a much wider uh, organisation, still involved in litter and the environment in general, but also uh, involved in a lot of community uh, activities as well, or volunteering activities. How, how Cape Victoria Beautiful started. It goes back to a lady called Dame Phyllis Frost, who some of you may have heard of. Um, back in the day, Dame Phyllis was a, a very strong advocate, both for the environment and women's prisons. Um, she was the type of woman who was able to speak to the people she wanted to speak to, um, which is not, not easy to do now. Um, but she was a very strong-willed person. And as the story goes, she was driving up to Bendigo one day to uh, uh, present a speech um, and driving up called a highway and uh, at some stage a truck drove past her. Um, but not long after the truck passed her, the driver decided he was going to clean out the rubbish from the cabin of his truck. That in itself didn't please Dame Phyllis. Um, but she even got more annoyed when some of the rubbish started hitting her brand new car that she was driving on the day. She had a memory that didn't forget a lot. Um, so when she eventually returned to Melbourne, she turned up at uh, the government officers in Melbourne and just demanded that she wanted to speak to Sir Henry Bolte, who was the Premier of the day. And she went through the story and some other issues around litter and uh, you know, the end of the story was basically she said to, to Sir Henry, and I believe we need an anti-litter campaign. And apparently Sir Henry sort of rocked back in his chair, went a bit pale, signed up for about 10 seconds, which is very unlike him and then rocked back up again and said, we need what? 
and she said, we need an anti-litter campaign. He says, oh, that's fine. I thought you said we needed an anti-liquor campaign. Um, so that's the beginnings of Keep Victoria Beautiful, how, how, how it started. Um, and it was very, very strong during the 70s and 80s. Um, now the organisation, as I said, is a bit broader. Uh, we run the awards programs both for metropolitan Melbourne and uh, regional cities and tidy towns for the rest of Victoria. We also run two volunteer programs. Um, the largest one is a thing called Adopt a Roadside, which is actually a Vic Roads program, but we manage that for them under contract. And that's where local volunteers go out and collect rubbish from the entrances to their towns. Um, they see the towns as one of the entrances, obviously, to their town, and they want it to look as good as they can make it. There's about 140 groups involved um, across the state. Uh, collectively, the groups look after about 700 kilometres, which, if you say quickly, doesn't seem like a lot. Just to give you a visual picture, if you wanted to drive 700 kilometres in Victoria, you'd need to drive from Orbost to Portland. So it's, you know, it is a significant piece of road that's being looked after. And collectively, the groups are picking up a very, very conservative 60 to 70 tonnes of rubbish each year. Um, the groups aren't required to weigh or measure uh, what they collect. So the figure that we quote is always, you know, we we believe very conservative and we believe it's probably significantly more than that. The other program is a thing called Station Is, which is a key Victoria beautiful program. There's 60 groups across the state and they're groups that do beautification works around their local railway station. The primary activity they do is to establish and then maintain garden beds around the railway station. Um, many benefits from that. One, the area generally looks better than what it otherwise would. Uh, it's a much more pleasant area for uh, passengers to go to. Uh, it provides the volunteers who do that with an outdoor activity, a physical activity, uh, an activity where they meet people that they may not have otherwise met. And it's also a very social activity. Um, a lot of the groups will do their gardening activity and then go and, have, go and have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea afterwards. And to me, in some ways, that's almost as important as the physical uh, gardening work that they're doing. So they're the two, uh, the two volunteer programs we run, the awards programs, as I mentioned, and yeah, just a, a brief, quick background of how Key Victoria Beautiful was started. Perfect. Thank you so much, Gary, for that. Wonderful. It is time to get started. And what I'll do is I'll call on the project name again. If for any reason that group's not here, I'll just skip over it. If you've missed your name getting called, something happened where you didn't hear it, I will at the end just ask if everyone has been called on. So don't worry, you will get your time or if you've attended today because you couldn't make your original scheduled day. Perfect, so we will go ahead and start with Salem Fest, Festival of Peace. Don't see them here. No worries. Um, South Bank Sustainability Group. Yes, hi. So do I just launch straight into what the project is about? Yep, so just give a brief overview of what your project is for a couple minutes so everyone can hear what you're doing. Oh, right. Yeah, so what we've done through the South Bank Sustainability Group, uh, which was basically uh, uh, 11 residents wanting to do more for sustainability, we ended up uh, giving our community a permanent uh, veggie garden. And through that, we created a lot of educational opportunities on wider topics around sustainability so that we reduce waste and we change our habits in our community. And more importantly, we finally created a sense of community where people want to keep coming back and interacting with nature and also want to do more for the environment. So apart from the hard evidence that we've seen in terms of numbers and CO2 emissions uh, that we've avoided through producing local food, uh, we've also seen a number of people joining our group. We're 160 people strong, and we hear so much feedback in terms of how people are shifting habits as a result of the activities that we're doing here. Is that within time? Yep. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your brief overview. Up next, we have Rainbow Celebration. 
No worries. Um, Aaron Dope. Might as well keep on going. Ship for Good Ink. Oh. Hi there. Hi, hi guys. I'm um, sorry for the background noise. They're um, constructing something next door, so I'll be quick. But congratulations to everybody and thanks for that info on um, Keep Victoria Beautiful, Gary. It's a great story. Um, I'm not sure if you know too much about Ship for Good, but uh, it's a, a, a not for profit that it was established to take over the MV Steve Irwin, the recently retired flagship of Sea Shepherd. Um, it's been set up within 12 months as a mixed event space uh, and museum to champion the 17 campaigns the ship's done, the majority of which to represent Australia's uh, environmental interests. And uh, the stories, the ongoing stories are the power of volunteering, what can be achieved if um, people work together. The main education around our constitution is education for ocean conservation to benefit the Sea Shepherd. And we do that with the ship tours, with interactive um, uh, exhibits and events. Um, we've been hit, like I'm sure a lot of people, quite hard with COVID shutdown, which has actually allowed us to get a lot done on the ship and also to collaborate with other like-minded not-for-profits to use the space on the ship, which, you know, we, we will welcome you to, to get involved. Um, we have Facebook and a website. It's um, ship with the number four good. Um, jump on and have a look. We've collaborated with Trash Bags on Tour with a men's mental health group called HALT, um, Free Food Forage, which um, educates people about the wonderful things around us that we can use as, as forage food um, to, to give value to things that people don't normally see value in in our environment. So in a short amount of time, we've created um, a lot of collaboration and hopefully when we can open up, we can, um, we can continue to reach out to other like-minded not-for-profits and community for tourism and education. So thanks for the opportunity and hopefully you can come and see the ship yourself. It's open every weekend. It's in Williamstown. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. Up next, we have Connecting People to Nature. And it is the Hobson's Bay Wetland Center. We'll just have you unmute. You're all good, Marilyn. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm, I, I'm Marilyn. I'm actually the chair of the Hobson's Bay Wetland Centre. And at our centre, we have a vision to connect everyone, absolutely everyone, to nature, to improve their health and well-being, and to be inspired to care for the natural environment. Um, a few years ago, we started by asking the question, how do we encourage the wider community to look after our natural environment? You know, we're, many of us are environmentalists already, but it's all those others out there. Everyone's so busy. What can we offer that will benefit them and the natural environment at the same time? And we do know that spending time in nature is vital for our health and happiness. And uh, when you get out in nature, it does promote environmentally responsible behaviour. So we started Hobson's Bay Wetland Centre. We're over in Altona and Melbourne's western suburbs are growing rapidly. And this is a compelling region, uh, reason for encouraging a better understanding. Uh, of nature and well managing the access to the nature in our built up areas. We're perfectly located close to the northwestern foreshore of Port Phillip and we're surrounded, we're very lucky, by beautiful wetlands, including the nearby Ramsar listed Cheatham wetlands. You may have heard of that. It's a wonderful birding spot. With the city skyline in the background, we're within easy reach of urban population of Melbourne. And so we offer workshops, open days and citizen science programs to, to all. Um, during the pandemic, of course, it's been a bit tricky and we've continued to main our on, maintain our online presence and had a few online sessions. But what we've been doing, a major focus for us is to establish a purpose-built centre in the next few years. And we're aiming for a valuable community asset in Hobson's Bay, where individuals, children and families can enjoy and care for the environment. And so we're working with a number of strategic partners um, and key organisations who, who, like us, understand the importance of caring for nature. And our local council, the city of Hobson's Bay, has identified us as a regional priority and helping us achieve the vision. So we're down in Altona in our temporary accommodation in the Traganina Wetland Centre. And we really do hope that you'll be able to come and visit us soon and check out what's happening on our Facebook page. Wonderful, thank you so much, Marilyn. Up next, we have Salem Fest Youth. 
here, no worries. Um, community solar connections. I think that's me. Um, hey everyone, I'm Beck Nichols from the City of Stonington and the Environment Team. Um, so for this project, um, I guess we really started with some very low rates of solar uptake in Stonington, um, particularly in Turak, which actually has some of the lowest rates in, in Melbourne. Um, so we decided to partner with Turak Primary School uh, to raise awareness of the benefits of solar and bring an information session to Turak Primary School. Um, so we worked with a green team and the years three and four of uh, Turak Primary School, including their amazing teacher, Sebastian Beck. Um, and we ran an information session at the school, um, but it was the students role to promote that session. So they learned first about solar technology, renewable energy. Um, they learn about the rates of solar in Stonington and Turak. Um, and they learn about the power of a school community. You know, how many people they can reach um, through their parents, their grandparents, their aunts and uncles and their friends. Um, and then they actually ran a campaign for the school community um, to promote that information session. So they gave presentations to the whole school, to staff rooms, they put up posters, they made a video that we shared online as well. Um, and they did a really awesome job. Um, we had about 55 people along to that session, which was a really good outcome for us. Um, and a, a new audience as well that we hadn't seen at, along at other events. Um, we had an expert from the Australian Energy Foundation along to present. Um, and the students actually opened the event up with a comedy routine um, with some complete with some solar jokes. So that was um, pretty amazing. Um, and yeah, we've checked the uh, rates of solar recently, just in the last couple of months, and we were pleased to see a slight increase. Um, I think there was 30 extra homes that had installed solar. So I reckon we can uh, say the students were responsible for some of them, which is really awesome. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Beck. Up next, we have Jonathan Law Partnerships for a Greener Future. Anywhere. Um, volunteer training for bushfire and drought prevention. Okay. Um, the Rotary Club of Glen Ferry. Oh. Hello, good morning, Emma. Good morning, everybody, and it's good to hear so many great projects that, that have been happening around Victoria at this time, and I think they're all needed. But my name's John Hudson, and I've been a member of the Rotary Club of Glen Ferry for more than 23 years. The Rotary Club has been heavily involved in many community activities, and since joining, I have participated in a number of those activities, which I'll indicate now. In 1999, we established the Burundara Family Network, which is a free community service that can assist families with newborn babies, new to the area, isolated from tr traditional supports, from all cultural backgrounds, and suffering perhaps from stress or possible postnatal depression. I've been treasurer for many years and arranged for the Burundara Family Network to be registered as a charity with the ACNC and also benefit from deductible gift recipiency status with the ATO. The project is still running successfully and services around 60 families every year. In 2003, in conjunction with the city of Burundara, we established the Burundara Farmers Market. This allows Victorian farmers to bring their own produce to a third and fifth Saturday of each month market. It is still running successfully and I've been manager for more than 11 years and the managing and organization of the market is totally voluntary. Because of this, all funds raised now in excess of 1.3 million can and are used for community projects. One of the community projects is the Burundara Foundation Chances, now called Education Chances Project. This provides scholarships for students attending secondary schools in Burundara whose families have financial difficulties, and that has to be evidenced with a Centrelink certificate. And without the scholarship, they, the children may not have been able to attend the school. The project offers scholarships to more than 100 students each year, totaling around about $100,000. 
and has been operable for the past 12 years. During that time, more than a hundred, more than a thousand students have benefited and all but one of those students has proceeded to tertiary education. The project is also recognized by the ATO and has deductible gift recipiency status. Uh, the Rotary Club also supports an ophthalmologist member of the club and team of other eye medicos to visit the Indonesian island of Sumba. It's a very third world country area uh, to carry out eye testing and surgery on members of the local population. Volunteers from the Rotary Club travel with the doctors and help when necessary in the coordination of medical examinations and surgery and offering reassurance to patients. I visited as a volunteer and saw 92 surgical treatments, cataracts, etc., and also the handing out of several hundred pairs of glasses to the locals who did not require surgery. All medical staff and volunteers pay their own way and the Rotary Club assists with the transport cost of the equipment that's needed to be taken to the island to complete the surgery. Unfortunately, this hasn't occurred in 2020, uh, 2020 because of the COVID virus. The result of my involvement with Rotary activities over these past 20 years has resulted in my award as the 2019 Burundara Citizen of the Year. And it's been a great honor to have been involved with these projects and to be involved in, in many of the Rotary activities that are happening that I haven't mentioned here. Uh, and uh, we, do, we do have a keep Victoria beautiful uh, litter collection a day every year, uh, or a weekend every year, actually. So that's uh, done as part of our club's activities. So thank you for the opportunity of letting you know a little bit about our Rotary Club. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Up next, we have Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day. Okay. Um, restoration of Fences. I'm not missing anyone waving. All right. Um, Rohan Hodges. Right. Um, community and Council Food Waste Diversion. Roll right here. All right. Um, National Recycling Week social media campaign. Hi, that's myself from Port Phillip and my colleague, Benita. Hi. Hi, Emma. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so um, yeah, two minutes <laughs> is on. Um, so in uh, 2000, 2019, the operating model for recycling in the city of Port Phillip was collecting all materials, then sending them to a third party for sorting and offshore processing. So um, that offshore uh, delegation created a disconnect for residents who held little interest in the end result of what they played in their recycling bin. That model changed, however, with China's introduction of the national sword policy. Um, at that time, Council's third party processor, SKM Recycling, was no longer shipping their backlog of recyclable material offshore for processing. So that backlog became a stockpile, continued to build, and a decision was made to ship all of that recyclable material to landfill that was picked up by the media. So it became a really big story and the impact on resident behaviour was quite immediate. So as a council, Port Phillip aimed to minimise the damage from that event and look for local recycling solutions so the material could be processed. But the message that residents received was that recycling no longer mattered because it was going to landfill. So by the time we got a replacement arrangement in place, the impact had been sustained. And we decided to launch a campaign to re-engage residents in recycling and tell them that by recycling their material, they were still having an impact. So this was time to coincide with National Recycling Week last year. And um, we decided to produce a series of videos to remind residents um, that their recycling mattered. 
Yeah, and um, those videos covered a range of topics, um, including what can and can't be in each bin, and we're broadcast on our social media pages. So um, it was viewed almost 6,000 times and shared to 35 external pages, and the campaign was expanded by the Metropolitan Waste and Resource Recovery Group too, who featured the campaign in their monthly newsletter as part of their council spotlight segment. So uh, more importantly, however, the campaign gave us the launching pad to rebuild the trust we'd held with our residents and convince them we all played a critical part in recycling right and we're still doing it. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much to the both of you and we're going to skip back to what I read over a little fast, um, Council and Community Food Waste Diversion. Yeah, sorry about that one. That was my project. Um, so I work for the Zoo Corp and work with Siobhan Benita as well. Um, and the program that I'll be touching on is our worm farm relocation program. So previously at St Kilda Town Hall, we used to have 16 worm farms that serviced um, the 400 to 500 staff that worked at St Kilda Town Hall. Um, and although this is a really great interactive tool for staff and members of the community, it was proven to be very costly to maintain because we had to outsource the maintenance of that. Um, and also quite restricted in what materials could be accepted um, because worm farm is a little bit fussy um, and it kind of meant that our extensive event space wasn't actually recycling any of their food waste. So as a result of all this, um, this project actually involved transitioning from the worm farms to just a food organic collection service with an external contractor, um, which really was fantastic because it removed any limitations on staff as to what materials could go in. We could basically say, if you could eat it at one stage, pop it in our food waste bins. And it also meant that we could expand the collection service to our rent space as well. Um, and basically with the impact of that internally meant that there was actually a 95% decrease in our monthly service fees, transitioning to that external contractor, which actually meant that we had some funding to upgrade the internal bin infrastructure that was available to staff. So new bins and some new signage and also meant that we could start developing some really targeted, um, clear and concise educational pieces for staff as well. Um, and also because of transitioning to that service, it meant that we were able to conduct an expression of interest with community groups and school groups to rehome those 16 worm farms. So we actually had an overwhelming response from the community wanting to participate in that program. And we were actually able to select 11 individual sites, including early learning centres, primary schools, high schools, and community centres to rehome those farms. And the resounding feedback that we've received from those sites was that the worm farms have helped them to integrate food waste education into the sustainability curriculum, um, which is a really fantastic result in itself. And although this program actually came about in relation to food waste diversion, there's, this is actually a real first step for many of those sites into food waste management alone. Um, so I'm actually really proud of the impact that this project had at St Kilda Town Hall, but also more broadly in the community. Perfect, thank you so much. Up next, we have the glass recycling trail. That's us. So just apologies for the mask. We're in office today and this is the current state. Uh, so the glass recycling trail was introduced in March 2020 as a means of testing glass recycling through the city of Port Phillip. A few things led to the trial's creation, including the suggestion from the state government that would have a four bin system within the next 10 years. So um, while Port Phillip is all about maximizing recycling, census figures highlighted that 90% of our population reside in either medium or high density housing. Um, that means 90% of our population probably wouldn't have capacity to house an extra bin. Um, so we decided to uh, trial a house or glass recycling bin in homes and had room to store them and decided to launch a communal glass recycling option for those living in high density housing like multi-unit developments. So um, we rolled out 120 litre bins to 180 homes in Garden City and uh, also installed four 660 litre bins across public spaces in South Melbourne and Albert Park areas. So knowing the importance that data would play in the trial, we developed the GIS-based data capture tool that allowed us to really standardise our audits and capture behavioural data on utilisation and contamination throughout the length of the trial. So we built our audit form within the platform itself, then we fitted QR codes to every bin, 
then we use the data that we gain to tailor our educational responses to our residents. So where bins were contaminated, we reported the cause and we issued a personalised response. And where bins were clean, we issued a thank you or a well done tag. So um, throughout the project, we also audited the existing yellow recycling bins in Garden City and applied the same tailored model to improve sustainable behaviour. And the results, um, after two months, we had to increase the communal bins from four bins to nine and increase collections from once a week to twice weekly. We also captured twice the amount of glass in the communal bins as we did the household bins. And we did so with a contamination rate of just 2%. Uh, but best of all, in adopting the auditing model that we used in the glass trial to the yellow recycling stream, it also allowed us to improve contaminations from uh, contamination rates from a pre-trial baseline of 41% to 11% in the first five months. So that's a whopping reduction of 30% and one we're aiming to sustain in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Up next, we have the Summer Ranger Program. Thank you, that's me again. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about the Summer Rangers who are for council a seasonal team of waste educators who conduct field work across all of the open spaces in our municipality, beaches, parks and streets um, over the warmer months, which coincides normally with our peak visitation period. So the team's existed for about 10 years and over that time they've liaised with locals, visitors and businesses as well to help deliver our Summer in the City campaign, as well as conducting thousands of litter audits and helping to build one of the largest local litter data sets in Victoria. Um, the program itself has traditionally been anti-litter focused, but gradually it's evolved to promote Council's broader waste strategy and that encompasses waste avoidance and minimisation, reduction in use of synthesis plastics and our recycling services, landfill diversion, including composting at home and in the community. So the team does this through interactive engagements, event attendance, community forums, social media and patrols in open space. And last season they had hundreds of personal interaction and reached tens of thousands of people through social media to personify really a call to action for everyone to play their part in keeping the city clean, inviting and safe. So we feel the program delivers unique value to the community because it provides an opportunity to have conversations that are casual, but vibrant and to engage with our team face to face and have in-depth discussions about what matters to that individual and is relevant to them regarding waste and sustainability. And it invites members of the public into a conversation that some might not otherwise take part in also to come away with positive and actionable information about what impact they can have as an individual and the services that can support them to do it. So this season is likely to look pretty different in terms of visitation, but we'll continue to grow in response to those specific topics that are of interest to our community around litter waste and sustainability. Well, thank you so much. Up next, we have Growing Our Urban Forest Together. That one's me from the City of Sunnington. Um, so every year we celebrate National Tree Day at the City of Sunnington um, with a bunch of tree planting events. Um, I think 2019, safe to say, it was probably our biggest year yet. Um, we added 10,000 Indigenous plants to our, our parks and environment across four different days and we worked with the community, um, with schools and with council staff to do this. Um, we had 300 stu school students join us um, to learn about local biodiversity and add they added 6,000 plants to our parks um, and that's an awesome opportunity for schools to connect with our parks and gardeners. Um, we also had over 160 volunteers attend our community tree planting day um, and that event we ran in partnership with the Friends of Gardeners Creek Valley um, and also Rotary, Chadston East Malvern um, and Holmes Glen TAFE students as well um, and they added 3,000 plants to the environment. Um, that's a really awesome day and finishes with a good old-fashioned barbecue hosted by Rotary. Um, and then our council staff day, we added 10, uh, 1,000 plants to um, a local park over lunchtime. And that's a really awesome opportunity for people to connect with colleagues that they might not otherwise meet. So yeah, all in all, 10,000 Indigenous plants added to our parks and environment and a really good event. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much back again. Up next, we have Heritage Strategy and Action Plan 2018 to 2029. Hi there, uh, Susan Price from the City of Stonington. 
Uh, thanks so much for allowing us to participate. And it's, you know, we're really pleased to be involved in such a worthwhile organisation and be here amongst all these, you know, really good and diverse projects. Our project is under the heritage and culture category. Uh, so we talked a bit about our long and sort of peppered history back in the 90s. There was a lot of voluntary heritage and uh, to be frank, it wasn't very well regarded. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time in the 2000s trying to, um, you know, change that and also enable some good support to have heritage protection. So to that extent, we, um, we thought we came up with quite a holistic strategy in 2006 and uh, we thought it was pretty innovative at the time. Uh, we prepared a, a thematic environmental history to identify gaps that we could um, look to protect across the municipality. So we had a, a robust uh, strategic justification. Uh, very pleased to say that it did result in over 2000 new places being protected in the scheme and, and hopefully over that time, sort of quite a transition. So in 2018, when it was time to review the strategy, um, we took the opportunity to really step it up. Um, so some of the, the key things that, that we've included is we've taken a whole of council approach this time. Uh, so it's not just about our, our small team trying to, you know, uh, create the change. It's, it's about leading by example. Um, some of the examples of that, are we have a Stonington History Centre. So people can access information and they, they have courses and just providing good education out there. Uh, as well for education, we have some heritage guidelines, which we included in our planning scheme that really helps people understand how they can uh, renovate their places in keeping with heritage. Um, we also have done conservation of a number of council buildings and uh, there was some artifacts found and preserved as part of the Paran Square uh, project uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and now we're, we're really kicking off on a whole of municipality gap study. So it's been slightly hampered by COVID um, and being able to do site visits, but we're really excited about that. Uh, and the other thing is just really improving the access to information um, for people who want to understand and know about heritage. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Okay, thank you so much. Up next, we have Purple E-Waste Eater School Visits. That is me again. Um, so uh, uh, this one again from City of Sunnington. Um, to celebrate National Recycling Week, um, we took our giant purple e-waste eater um, out and about to the streets and collected um, hundreds of items of e-waste from local schools. Um, we went to Malvern Valley Primary School where students worked to raise awareness of the Victorian e-waste ban um, that recently came into effect um, and also the need to responsible, res responsibly recycle electronics. Um, students did audits of e-waste in their homes and encouraged their families to repair and donate working items. Um, the class with the most audits celebrated with a class party, which was um, definitely what the students were after. Um, we also went to Windsor Primary where the green team had been working hard to educate the school community. Uh, the bins sparked lots of interest and great conversations from parents at pick up and drop off, um, many of whom weren't uh, aware of the e-waste ban recently coming into effect. Um, we also had another school, Armandale Primary School, run a really successful collection day, um, collecting a whole uh, 660 litre skip bin of e-waste and um, students ran a uh, waste sorting game, um, sorting different items of waste into different recycling streams um, and council is now looking to install e-waste recycling hubs in local schools to continue to avoid e-waste in landfill. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much again. And our last one is the Great Summer Clothes Swap. Oh, that's me again. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, so for this one, um, this was last year in February as part of the Sustainable Living Festival. Um, we hosted the Great Summer Clothes Swap at the Melbourne Town Hall. Um, so this was definitely the biggest clothes swap we've hosted to date at Council um, and we actually think it's the biggest swap in Victoria. Um, we had over 500 swappers, um, more than 1500 items of clothing were swapped and rehomed. Um, so as well as the main clothes swap event, attendees also filled our banquet hall for talks, exploring decluttering and conscious consumerism, sustainable fashion and op shopping. 
Um, attendees were also super interested in visiting the bunch of community stalls that we had um, and council's information stall was a non-stop with residents learning about composting and taking our recycling um, sorted out challenge and also um, leaving pledges as well. Um, a follow-up survey found that most attendees were planning on making changes in their home or in their life after attending the event, um, like more swapping, more op shopping, buying less, decluttering or improving their recycling at home. Um, so yeah, this is the third year that council has run the closed swap um, and we'll continue to explore ways to engage and in, um, educate our community on responsible fashion and con conscious consumerism. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And just before I wrap up to make sure, was there anyone else who I did not call on or attended today because they couldn't make the other day they were assigned? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for everyone for attending. I'm quickly going to pass over to Sabina to say some final words and then we will have everyone unmute themselves and give a big round of applause for everyone. Thank you so much, Emma, for hosting. And thank you so much for everyone attending. This is one of my favourite times of the year at Cape Victoria Beautiful because I get to hear all about these amazing projects and they all really inspire me. So you've all done a fantastic job. So, um, yeah, so as part of the awards, we've you've had the judging. So that wasn't today. So you've all been judged for your projects and the judges have had that hard job of, deciding which projects are best because I think they're all fantastic um, and today is a great opportunity to hear about projects and we've actually got these happening um, all week at 10 a.m so if you'd like to come along and hear about some other projects um, because yeah it really puts a pep in my step when I hear all about these projects um, so then the next stage if we don't see you during the week it will be at the awards which is the 12th of November which is an online event um, because we've had to plan that with you know the restrictions at the time so thank you again for all the work that you do and if we could all please unmute Emma with her magic thing. We can all give everyone a big cheer, but yeah, great for these all these great projects. Emma, press the button. Good luck, everyone. Yeah, and good luck, and you're all winners because it's just amazing projects. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for telling me all about them. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. All the best. Thanks.